Hello, we're back. We took a month off for our usual Vegas things, shenanigans. Leaf, did you have fun? Yeah, always. Swathi, did you go? Yeah, I was, I went family vacay, so I had fun. Good, Will? Yeah, I was there with you and Leaf, so of course we had fun. <laughs> we, we had fun, yeah. All right, good. Leaf, take it away. Cool. So we've got a few free news shill items. One of them is that SEMGREP is hiring. Specifically, I have two software engineering roles. We have a bunch of other roles, but apply to my roles. So if you want to do some software engineering at a security company, we'd love to chat with you. I will also be attending Lead Dev in New York next week. I'm not presenting or anything, but if you happen to be there uh, and want to say hi, shoot me a DM on Twitter or LinkedIn. And then Travis has a case study with Block that he is really proud of. And that will be in the show notes. But Travis, maybe if you want to give like one or two sentences about that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you start a business, frankly, at least me, I wasn't sure if I was completely full of shit or not and whether people like really care about the thing that we're building. Do we Lock get to was... weigh in on whether you're full of shit? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You should definitely do that. But yeah, so we were very fortunate. We found great partners like Block early and they've collaborated with us to build the product that we have today. And then we got far enough along with Block that they're finding a lot of value in the platform and they were willing to help tell the world about what that is and, and why they did it. So please, anybody check that out. It's probably the thing that I'm most proud of you know, for the company to date. And I think it gives a good representation of what Resourcely is and how it might be able to help you. All right, on to news. Leaf, you got the first one. Cool. Yeah, so this April, a hacker using the handle USDOD, which I'm sure the government loves when you pick handles like that and doesn't want to target you even more than they already do, claimed to have a huge amount of information available for sale from national public data, a Florida-based data broker and criminal background check company. The original posting was for 3.5 mil, which on some, you know, by some definition seems really low to me, but also I guess a lot of this stuff is out there already. So maybe it isn't that low, but they claim to have information on almost everyone from the US, the UK and Canada. So if that data or if that's true, like that is quite a lot of data. A Krebs reader alerted Krebs that another NPD property was hosting an archive file that included admin names and passwords. And the exposed archive also showed that all users were assigned the same six digit password during account creation and told to change it, but there was no mechanism that like actually ensured that that had happened. And they also discovered that the website that hosted all of this information about probably you was built by some web development contractors in Pakistan. And so every time I hear about these data brokers, I'm just like, these things should not exist. They're doing a horrible job handling our data and criminals love them. So I thought from this, if this is the one I'm thinking about, I think there's some fun in here. I think that it was basically a roll-up of other breaches that they put together. For example, there wasn't a lot of records where it was like your full name plus your social, social security number. It was like social security number or some information about you. And I think what attackers really need is like the full thing. So was that this breach or was that something else? There was another social security number big thing that went around. I think it was from this one. Yeah, I think it was this one. I think there's some FUD around this, so unclear whether it was like a big direct breach or whether it was like an aggregation of other stuff. Well, the article from Krebs said that there would be like multiple entries depending on like where you've lived. So there might be like an entry from like your current location and like a previous location. And he also said that some of it was out of date. Like, I think he said that his own info was out of date. But yeah, I'm sure that there's like complete records in here. And it sounds like if, if you're somebody who's lived in the same place, like it's more likely to have accurate data. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. I didn't pay I think for it. Troy Hunt had something about this uh, not being as much of an issue as, as this was reported to be. I mean, it's obviously, it's interesting regardless. And I think as citizens, we should take it for granted that our social security numbers with our full information will be disclosed at some point and then prepare accordingly. I think the best thing that we can do is credit freeze, as I've said here before. Yeah, do you think that there's like any chance in the next 20 years that this system gets replaced? Like it really seems like you need 
something that doesn't rely on a number that you just give to everybody that you rent an apartment from and like every dentist you see and like every credit card company and like the credit card companies probably do a better job than most, but like I've given my social security number to so many people that it's probably just in their email somewhere, or like in a file or something, you know. I'm so old that when I was a student, the last four of my social security number was the identifier. And they would that was, post- that was mine too. Yeah, yeah. They, they would Student post ideas grades. were your social. Yeah. yeah, they would post grades that way. They would like have a sheet on the door of everyone's grades by their social. Oh. And the last four of your social is actually the only secret part. The first five yeah. are calculatable based on like where you grew up and when you grew up. That has changed, but for older people, 100%. Yeah. Where'd know. you grow up, Travis? <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your mom's middle name <laughs> what, hospital you, what hospital were you born at yeah, yeah exactly and this is the, what was your friend's name yeah I, your friend's name yeah I, you know, screw I mean, it. just tell us your social let's go i think the i think the way we would have to move here is like some strong auth obviously but there's a lot of problems so when we discuss this always it's like all right so you can have you know people have phones but what about the people that don't have smartphones they're still going to need some way to authenticate themselves there's a, there's a cool project that some folks are doing where they're going to use like biometrics with a strong hardware device, like basically like an iris scan, and they'll use that to authenticate you, but that requires a phone too. So I think there's a whole bootstrap problem. If you ask within 20 years, I'd give that less than 50% chance that we'll get it done. Government moves so slowly and like there's a lot of edge cases out there. If you were willing to say only people with smartphones can do it, it would be higher, but I think we're always going to have to fall back to something kind of crappy and old yeah. school. I think if we, if we look at like how long a real ID has taken to roll out, that'll give you an indicator for how long this will take to get replaced. Yeah, it would be really nice if there was some system where you had to go and like give people access where it's like, oh, this, you know, person wants to pull your credit. Okay, it's going to send a request to some system that you go into and you're like, yeah, this entity can see my credit history for 30 days or whatever. But I agree like that there's a lot of people that would get left behind by that system. And even just rolling out that system would take a long time, even if we thought it was a good idea. Yeah. I'm curious though, why y'all kind of just went to, hey, let's replace the system versus, you know, is it that strengthening existing controls is like it's a lost cause or... I think so that's the, the point is there are, there's no control. If you, mm-hmm. if you know the information, you can just go use it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to add something onto it. So it's not just, you know, the social security number, but it's something else too. Mm-hmm. That's going to require probably, I mean, if we think about like the, the factors of auth, it's going to be either like two things that, you know, which is kind of dumb. Yeah. Um, Cause those will probably get leaked together or something, you know, plus something you have or something you know, plus something you are. So both of the something you have and something you are are going to require like technology and some kind of a hardware thing that we will probably take forever to roll up. Like it'd be nice if I give you my social security number and you're my doctor, you can't actually pull the information with just that number. It's like you yes. put a request with that number and then I approve the request. All right, Swathi, you got the next one. Yes, so this is an open source tool from Datadog Security Labs. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Grimoire, that's the name of the tool. So, you know, the story here at Datadog Security Labs, they're talking about how can you reduce the feedback loop of detection engineering, right? Like, so there is like reproduction, reproducing the specific rule, then analyzing the logs. For me, this is, I think, this is more about kind of combining blue team and red team together. So this open source project is designed, you know, simplifying sort of identification of what are specific cloud audit logs that are generated as part of the common attack techniques. And then you kind of first use the detonation technique, you do the detonation, and then you kind of pull the cloud trail event history and pinpoint what are some of the exact logs that are triggered by the attack. And then you kind of use that to either fine tune your specific detection rule or develop your detection rule. It also works with transparently through Stratus Red Team, which has kind of known growing catalog of AWS attack techniques. So for me, it kind of was a more mix of 
detection engineering and kind of use red team tactics as much you know yeah i guess you could you could see you could say that it's a it's a reduction of like the feedback uh, loop cycle so yeah if if folks want to try it out there's kind of detailed instruction on how to install then how we kind of go back and look at event history seems like a good write up and also i think if there is no kind of, there are lots of security teams with no official like red teaming, right? Like, so this seems like sort of an easy way to, why don't you do that versus, you know, when there is no dedicated red team and, and blue team. I have something spicy. Mm -hmm. What's all of your philosophy on red team? I think that they're overvalued. I think that should almost never be anybody's first hire. I think the red team, if they're good, they're going to go straight to the obvious stuff that everybody knows is going to get them compromised. It's like, oh, they fished my executive, you know, email, got them to click something and now they're on a box and then they move laterally and whatever. Like, why do you need a red team to validate that? I don't know if that's a spicy take or people are making their first hire as a red teamer. No, not even first. Like I wouldn't put them in the top hundred. Like, I don't, I don't think you should hire a red team until you have basically like all of the basics covered. Yeah, I think red team is makes sense once you have a sophisticated enough security program defensively to warrant a red team and up until you get to that point like there's a million things that you just need defensive people to go and solve and then you just hire pen testers and like maybe you contract at, at an actual red team assessment if you need one i'd say a lot of red team i think these days are used as that pen test arm of product security yeah. i know that you know, we, we utilize our, our red team here as a mechanism for that, where ProtSec is too busy and we need to get this tested and we don't have budget or a, a external assessment tested. So we'll put the red team on to, to pick it apart kind of deal, which you know always helps versus the external because we they theoretically have internal access to systems already and you could do a complete black box or gray box or however you want. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd agree that it definitely shouldn't be in your first set of hires. Uh, the company definitely needs to be in a stage where you're ready for that or your red team needs to be really well structured with some fine set of rules versus just the open-ended just go find stuff and break it now to counteract yeah. myself i've definitely had cases where like we knew for a fact that we were vulnerable to a certain situation and it wasn't until somebody went and proved it to the engineer that owned that system like hey look i just broke this thing that something actually got done like that's definitely not my preferred method of interaction. I'd prefer that we could just say like, hey, this is exactly how this is going to work. But sometimes people actually need to see it to, to kick them into gear. So that's the counterbalance to my point. Yeah, but, agreed. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I can see that. I can see on one side, right? Okay. It's very easy to generate risks, right? Like it's always a lot easier to generate risk versus fixing them and mitigating them or closing them or accepting them, whatever you want to whatever the the mechanism is. So in that sense, yeah, it seems like, you know, red team constantly generates these risks, right? Like constantly generate these findings. But yeah, I have seen cases where you can use red team as a lever to influence, persuade, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go straight to that and say, hey, we found something and we've, we've popped the service. Now let's talk. But that does happen, right? Um, it's a way to kind of convince folks. Yeah, on the other side, I do think Red Team is an area that's great to offset with third party. If you can get someone to do an assessment to Will's point, either like an extremely open-ended, right? Like, hey, you have six, seven, eight weeks and see what you can find. Or a, a really specific one. Hey, we are looking for credit cards through this attack path. See if you can. So I think initially you can offset that with contracting services, but then as your team matures, I think that you can have somebody in-house and then, yeah, also have them do sort of other activities like pen testing and figure out other product security findings. So yeah. next story, next, go ahead, gonna, last word. Right, right. Yeah, if you wanted to just have somebody identify or like external identify something that you already know about that people aren't taking seriously, you could just pick your favorite bug bounty hunter in your program yes. and just be like, hey, write this up, we'll pay you the five grand and then that's cheaper. Yep. All right, next story I initially picked up because wait, the- Wait, 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 hold on. All right, well, back you, to you. You got off the story so fast, we didn't even get to talk about it. But one, just wanted to quickly say, I, I like what they're doing. It reminded me of Trailblazer that I wrote at Netflix mm. where 
I was trying to figure out everything logged by CloudTrail and the mechanism and like what it was logged as. And the mechanism I used was in the, in the session name for AWS, I would use the API action that I called. And so you could map back what was it actually. So very similar to UUID, kind of what they're using in user agent. Yes. I actually like the user agent approach quite a bit. Yeah, these I think these things are great for automated ways of testing. Travis loved Trailblazer because it cost him a lot of uh, money to go out of his bank. 36K um, bill. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I'd also call out, for me, so really something similar called Cloud Console Cartographer, which was trying to map as you're doing things in the console, what is actually being called behind the scenes, which I thought was kind of cool too. So y'all might check that out also. All right, go ahead, Travis. All right, wonderful. So the next story, the initial article that I read triggered me because it was so poorly written. It was talking about basically advanced attackers like looking for secrets and M files. But I think Leaf probably was gracious enough to add the unit 42 right up to the show notes. And that one's actually good. So there's some interesting stuff in here. The initial attack vector is very dumb. So it's basically .m files that contain secrets. You know, we've seen this a million times, right? Secrets and code. What are those secrets in this case? They are long-lived IAM static credentials. It's like these things are, are the devil. They shouldn't be in there. So attackers found these in mass, and then they started running Will and my favorite chain, which is get color identity followed by immediate list buckets. Will and I actually rolled out detection at Netflix that will find those two things together because... There's very little actual legitimate developer use for calling those two things immediately. Uh, a lot of times folks get caller identity for anyone that doesn't know is basically like the cloud who am I equivalent. But then if you're immediately listing buckets, you're probably trying to figure out like, where are you and what do you have? So that's what the attackers did next. And then they tried to spin up basically a crypto miner. They started off with EC2 and they failed. My guess, they didn't say this in the article, but my guess is a, an SCP blocked it. The article did say that they were trying to spin up a C2G instance type and C series instances in particular are very often used in crypto mining because they have a lot of compute. The attacker with the roles that they have, this is the, the part that just horrifies me. With the static credentials that they found in code, they were actually able to create a role and attach that role to an instance or, or a Lambda in this case. And so if you have secrets in code and then you have so much permissions on those secrets that they can go and mess around with IAM. That's like game over. Like you, I don't want, I want to be like too mean here, but like you deserve whatever bad things happen to you if you have those two things together. Like IAM static credentials should never be able to do anything else with IAM. That's just awful. Anyway, so attackers spun up a Lambda and then from the Lambda, they ran scripts. The Lambda scripts would go and exfiltrate buckets that they could go see data from buckets and then put ransom nodes in there. One thing that was interesting in the article called out that I hadn't seen before. So a, a good way to detect this would be have ob object level logging in your S3, access trail, like uh, cloud trail, stuff like that. But if you don't have that, like many folks don't because it's expensive, you can actually use cost and usage reports in AWS to go and see what buckets probably fell victim to this. I hadn't heard this before, but I was initially triggered because the first article was dumb and use the word sophisticated to talk about finding M, M files and secrets in those. And then I was triggered by attackers used in mass M files with rules or basically like static credentials that allowed them to do IAM stuff, which is awful. I just, I don't understand how companies get to the point where people can create static credentials that have IAM mutate permissions associated with them. That's just like all governance off. People are just running around like doing crazy stuff. So I don't know. Am I wrong? Tell, I mean, tell us how you really feel, Travis. Yeah, I will. Exactly. <laughs> in the first story, we talked about archive file hosted on the website, publicly available with passwords in it. So like, I think this thing is worse though. Like it, people, you know, like there's a lot of like leaking stuff on the internet that shouldn't be like, oops, it's accidentally public and whatever. But I don't know, just like if you're running anything in cloud and you allow IAM to, to be like freely accessed and, and mutated, that's just awful. I was kind of surprised that somebody other than AWS was able to figure this out. Mm. Like big kudos to Palo Alto for discovering this and writing it up in a way that didn't make Travis upset. <laughs> yeah, they did a very good write-up. The Unit 42 group does a lot of good stuff. 
Wait, so uh, where did they find the end files? They were just publicly scanning them. From where? There must be like some like mass code repo search or something. Okay. That's what I was confused with. I'm also confused with like, if it was GitHub, those IM users would have been already like neutered, right? They would have been dep or revoked. So it had to have been somewhere else. And so that's where I'm like, well, where were these M files? Was it like InfoStealer hardware or like a campaign where instead of like trying to capture credentials, they just exfilled a bunch of .m files from people's desktops? Or... There was a lot of them. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of confused. Of where did they get all this data to begin with? But I don't think the article mentioned that. I was also confused on why. I think they, they did. It was sophisticated. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was also confused on why the EC2 got blocked and the Lambda got allowed hmm. through. I'm guessing there was like some kind of an SCP that was looking for specific EC2 spin up or something that wasn't configured for Lambda. But like, if you had that, like, why would you not have any kind of restriction on IAM mutate? question i don't know this is awful like could you all imagine like why that would be like why you just have like i am keys sitting there that are like keys that can go and perform what do you got what do you got leaf oh they were hosted in websites got it oh so something interesting i see yeah look leaf leaf's like read the damn article guys yeah well we could do that how do you get that though? You just like, just mass drop your folder onto the thing. That's not great. I mean, a dot M deployment is pretty common in web patterns, but I think you typically don't host that file publicly, but. The IAM thing is what's uh, bewildering to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're such an ass. <laughs> hey, you passed. <laughs> yes. How sure funny I though, if you failed. Yeah. If oh, it would have been awesome. If it would have pulled that up and there was keys in there, I would have like pulled this whole episode for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like it never happened. We would at least get a lot of views, Travis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. I have the next story to you. So the IRS is working to improve data security after a major tax return leak. This one just makes me sad. So the IRS is, quote, taking steps to shore up security, but the IRS watchdog has determined that the agency's cybersecurity approach in several areas is, quote, not effective. So basically what this is, there's a couple of categories. IRS internal employees will go and pull files that they don't, shouldn't have access to. There's no legitimate use for them and leak them. They speculate this is what happened with Donald Trump's return when that was leaked. But on top of that, the IRS in general, according to this group, Tenga, Tigna, Tig, Tigta, found that the IRS is lacking in key areas like MFA deployment broadly. And to me, if you think about like what data is actually sensitive and like a lot of security, frankly, it doesn't matter. Uh, if your credit card gets compromised, it's like not a big deal. You just get a new credit card number and it's fine. But your IRS tax return like has a ton of sensitive information in there. Like probably the most sensitive information that you ever submit in any form anywhere goes in your tax return. So I would expect the IRS to actually like take this very, very seriously. The other thing too, is there's a lot of fraudulent IRS tax filings. Like a lot of like people will file as you and get a return back. And I know that the IRS has shored some of this stuff up, but I don't know. Yeah. This one just made me sad because this system actually matters. And I would vastly prefer them to go a little bit slower and put good controls on there than to have the state that it apparently is in today. I actually had that happen to me. So somebody filed, I think, as me. Then I had to go through this whole battle of refuting it. Etc. How long did that take? A few months. Yeah. Nightmare. Did you end up losing anything? <laughs> no, thankfully not. I got That's a good. refund. Yeah. Wait, Why how do you... do you do that? Hmm? Get a refund. I want to get a refund. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Why do you think this is such a struggle? Like, obviously, like IRS is a big organization. You know, they're in the government, but like. Why, knowing that they have this treasure trove of data, why are they moving so slow on like basic security safeguards that other organizations have? I don't know. They probably like bureaucracy. You probably yeah. need a thousand signatures to go put a new control in place. Not a thousand, but I mean, it things is a lot of red tape, red tape, a lot of 
levels of approval and I'm sure, you know, things get lost somewhere and then someone else gets tasked to go do something else and it kind of gets dropped would, would be my best guess. Or, you know, you're working it, government gets defunded for a period because they can't agree on budget. And then once budget comes back, it's like, oh, well, we got these other problems. Let's tackle those instead. Yeah, I was thinking it's like a funding issue potentially. Like, do they have enough money to like build good software? I have a bone to pick with organizations that you don't choose to do business with that also do security poorly and also have sensitive data. Like, like the brokers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Data like, brokers. Yeah, like them, like the credit bureaus, like all of those kind of folks. It's like, all right, if you can choose to go into business with somebody and then they do security poorly, you can choose to do business with somebody else. But if you have, if you never had that choice in the first place and then your stuff gets leaked, it's very frustrating to me. All right, well, give us good news. Oh, yes. Good news, then maybe some bad news. All right. So sectemplates.com. It's a website by Robert Auger, I think. It's Robert A yep, uh, Robert. on his X profile, at Robert Auger. Really cool set of uh, templates online. Goal is to get you the ability to get up and running much faster. So you know, a great example, if you're running a security organization and you're thinking about doing a bug bounty, it's a great set of templates that you could use to get off the ground when it comes to bug bounty process, calculating metrics, run books, sample responses, you know, a lot of work put into to giving you some canned templates there. So on the GitHub, there is bug bounty, external pen testing, instant response and vulnerability management. So if you've been thinking about spinning up a vulnerability management program, you might take a look at the templates there available and kind of go from zero to you know hero, if you will. And, you know, maybe save yourself some work and or, you know, take a look and see what you're currently doing and see if there's anything that you could adopt. But I love this kind of stuff where it's like someone publishing best practices, essentially, you know, to let others learn from. Some would think, you know, as we have gone through our career, we've written tons of run books and processes and things. And, you know, we go to the next job and we have to do it all over again. It'd be you know, it'd be awesome if all this stuff was just available for folks, you know, beyond what, what was already published as part of this uh, SEC template. So hopefully this will continue to evolve and a lot more people get be contributors to this. Robert Auger lives less than 10 minutes away from me in Los Gatos. And we met up for coffee at Phil's the other day. And he was talking about this work and basically what he was doing, like he has had to stand these things up before. And every time he goes to a new job, he has to start from scratch. And his idea was like, what if I just put this all down and then I have it and everyone else has it too. I mean, I think most of these programs that he's open sourcing are like pretty standard from org to org. Like you can make small changes, but starting from scratch is insane. Just start from something that's really good. And somebody's put a lot of thought into it. These can obviously, since they're open source, folks can contribute, pull requests, issues, things like that over time. Yep. I think there's yeah. some places where you could buy a set of like, give me the first set of docs that you needed within security. But no one wants to have to go pay for that. It should just be something available. Sorry, Lee. It kind of reminds me of, I think it was PagerDuty a couple of years ago that open sourced their security training for yes. engineers and then non-engineers. Very much reminds me of that. Yeah, and I actually used that training as inspiration when we were when I was building incident response training at Netflix. But yeah, I love the SEC templates. And I think a couple of months ago, I started publishing some of this too. So like, if you take a look at my Git profile, and then there isn't a whole lot of overlap, so which is nice. So you could look at, uh, you know, look at Robert's SEC templates, this vulnerability management one, and then I also published a few on like risk management, like privacy, you know, threat intel. So yeah, I, I love that you have a repository that you can refer to. And not only I think if you're starting out, if you want to make improvements to your existing ones, right? Like kind of take a look at what others are doing and see see if you can up level or kind of get some elements into it. So yeah, nice work here. And while we're here, I'll shout out Magoo's startup security. Yes. Really good resources there as well. You should add that and swap these to the show notes. Good call. Will yeah. Do. All right, Will, you're up. All right, next up, talking about Ale Beast. Hmm. You haven't heard of it. It's a hot new, I don't know if you call it vulnerability, but hot new misconfiguration, if you will, or a code check that's needed. A company called Migo discovered that the default kind of guidance from AWS 
on putting authentication on a application load balancer. So for folks that aren't aware, in AWS, you can spin up an application load balancer and choose to put OIDC auth on certain paths. If you'd like, great way to implement you know, some really quick beyond trust kind of flows. In the original guidance, you know, they talk you through how to verify the JWT and, you know, in the JWT, it comes with the key ID, whatnot. You know, here's how you retrieve the key and how you could verify the signature. What Migo found was, well, that's great and all and protects you. But if the underlying application behind the load balancer is also internet facing and you aren't forced through the load balancer, that you could basically spin up your own ALB, get a JWT minted from it, and then provide that to an application and kind of spoof your way into that app. And so the attack basically goes as, <clears throat> you know, resourcely.io is behind an AOB, but the server running resourcely is also internet facing. Leaf wants to act as Travis. Leaf spins up an AOB in the same region as the resourcely AOB, configures OIDC auth, sets up his own IDP to say that he's Travis.mcpeak at resourcely.io, logs into his ALB, into Leaf's ALB as Travis, takes that JWT and provides it via the same header value that the ALB would provide to the server behind Travis's ALB. And then the server verifies the JWT as legit and lets Leaf in as Travis. So mitigation here is AWS has updated their documents to actually say that you should check the signer that is in the JWT as well, which should be the ALB that it was issued from as the like best full foolproof check. The other guidance is, you know, make sure that your traffic directly to the service behind the ALB is not available direct route, like right? really full, ensure that you have security groups set up that you have to go through the ALB. The reason because of this, the ALBs keep a session cookie and they'll verify whether that JWT matched the session cookie. So you can't present a rogue JWT through an ALB unless it was minted for that ALB. So the really cool research, you know, they say, where's the number is like 15,000 potential applications vulnerable to this. It's hard to tell, of course, without trying it. This is definitely a code implementation perspective. The thing that's irked me on this whole thing is AWS silently updated the docs. And then I think they contacted potential customers that had you know, the, the applications internet facing as, you know, not just behind the ALB, but they didn't tell everyone. And I feel like if you're updating guidance on how to verify, you know, this would be a bigger like communication. And so, uh, you know, kudos to Migo, wish AWS would have communicated more broadly. If you're listening and you use ALB auth, please go make sure that your things behind your ALB are not exposed as well. That's the best practice, but second, also make sure you're using the signer or verifying that the signer was your ALB. What y'all think? There's a lot here. I think that expecting people to be experts in ALB is enough to figure out how to get their app to ingress the security group associated with the ALB. If those people are developers is hard. Not to show my product too much, but this is like one of the things we want to make easier. We did a write-up on this too, for that very reason. But yeah, in general, the other part, the actual like verification in code is also very hard. We should make that easy for our users. We don't do anything with that part. So this is not a shill, but that needs to be easy for users too. And from AWS's notification perspective, like, yeah, of course they can't tell like what you're doing in code or whatever. So all they can see is if your ALB is configured to take traffic from the internet, which should probably, or your application is configured to take traffic directly from the internet and not its ALB. Like that makes sense for them to notify and it makes sense that they can't go and notify folks that have the code set up incorrectly. Yeah. I think for me, I would have like, I'd rather them notify and us not like us be configured correctly with all our apps behind the ALB, no traffic outside of it and not have to necessarily do anything. But my guess is like a lot of people set up ALB auth and the corresponding check based on how AWS had the documents. And so if you, did this a while back, you're probably not checking the signer. 
And it seems like something just good to do regardless. Because if you inadvertently open traffic, then you're going to set yourself up to this later on. And that's where I wish like communication would have been greater. I was actually talking to you know, Scott Barons about this. And I was like, I wish you could almost issue a CVE on like documentation. Because you know, then someone would actually be aware and be like, oh, yeah, I've looked at that documentation before. I, yeah, I need to do something about this kind of deal. And I think that's, I think, I think they're looking at actually issuing CVEs for cloud providers and stuff in the future as well. So, you know, I'd love to kind of see how this could expand it. Like, how do you notify customers or people more in general versus like someone on X just tweeting about it? I don't know. Is there any reason that AWS couldn't use their current mechanisms to say like, hey, we've updated guidance, go check out and make sure that you're in accordance with it? Right. This reminds me somewhat, though, of a funny story of Netflix days when Lemur was issued the CVE because of a dependency that it used. And it's like, it's not my CVE. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I remember Kevin being really bummed about that at one point. The actual research here, by the way, where like the attacker spun up their own ALBs and then used that to create the appropriate signing block that would match, that, that thing's pretty cool. Yeah. Very uh, creative, right? And thinking about it, you know, for a while I was like, wait, why aren't they actually uh, generating a unique key per customer for these things? Seems pretty easy to do. But even then, that wouldn't really matter because your know, key ID comes in the JWT. And, uh, you know, once again, the guidance is, you know, fetch the public key via this URL and it's like insert key here kind of deal. But I wish there was something more ingrained with like KMS or something to, you know, auto verify these things and, and take it out of the consumers, like the ability to mess up kind of deal. That makes sense. If you think of like the auth mechanisms and kind of plugins that we had at Netflix for doing it on behalf of our customers internally, you know, that's what I'd be hoping for. Give us another API call that we can make into AWS to say, is this JWT valid or something? And, you know, don't leave crypto up to a customer. I might be arguing against myself here, but I don't know why cloud providers don't make it easier to just have like packs. It's like, all right, you're going to do ALB plus compute. Like, obviously I hope the cloud providers don't do that. It would make my business more viable, but it seems like such a no brainer use case. Like the actual inter interaction between the ALB and your compute here is so important to get right. And like, the average user, you should just have components that go and do those things. Yep. All right, Swathi, you're up. Taking a break from all the breaches and news, this is a nice threat modeling guide um, for um, enterprise AI search tools. So Kane Naraway here has a really, really nice write-up. And also it acts as a framework uh, for folks wanting to do uh, threat modeling, you know, how to make risk-based decisions when you're evaluating a product, you know, how can you take certain actions to, based on your risk tolerance level in your organization? And then what are some of the things that maybe you should consider when you're doing an initial evaluation of these products? So yeah, enterprise AI search is pretty straightforward. It's like a productivity tool where, you know, it gives you a single plane of glass, taking all sort of the enterprise tools into consideration. So it ingests all of that data and gives you a great way to look for information that you need. So kind of this threat modeling sort of framework is broken down into, you know, three or four sections, which I thought was like super handy. It's great to see kind of, you know, as security engineers and security practitioners, we have to really look at like tools and say, how is this affecting the business, right? You know, we often say as security teams, we don't want to be sort of the hammer, right? Like we don't want to be the department of no. So if it's a, you know, specifically productivity tool, so how do you balance that productivity versus kind of security? There's obviously the risk of, hey, here is this one tool that ingests all this data. So it could be an attacker's, you know, worst nightmare. But I think kind of looking, looking at it from a positive lens of, you know, if this is going to help productivity and it's going to help the rest of the organization, how can can a security make it work? And then sort of the write-up goes into the details of, you know, 
what's a true risk analysis, right? Like, is there, you know, compliance standard that you have to adhere to, you know, like data residency requirements and things like that? What sort of operational cost will this have, right? Like, so as you can see, sort of this threat modeling write-up or even framework, you got to think about it in terms of not just confidentiality or integrity, like actual risk to the business or actual value it adds to the end users. And then um, also thinking of it in terms of, okay, cloud or on-prem, does it really matter? What are some of the pros and cons with that? And then the write-up kind of ends with, you know, it's a neat table of here are the top risks, here is the threat, and here is sort of the mitigations that you could do. So yeah, I think this is kind of on the lines of like the SEC templates and other things that we have talked about. I, I really like that it, you know looking at this from every lens of like privilege escalation and is there you know session token theft you know privacy assessments everything that you need to think through when you're doing threat modeling i really like this also because i think so many times as we're building our security programs we're focusing so much on the defense operations but it's like how can we get to more on the proactive side of things right how can we kind of get involved early on and i think threat modeling is one big way of doing that so yeah kudos to the person and yeah, really nice write-up. I was talking to one friend and they brought up that a lot of this, like kind of like, how do we secure the AI stuff is mm. dumb because OpenAI, Microsoft, Google have better security teams than 99% of people out there. And so like making sure that we don't send sensitive data to them, like makes no sense. They're probably going to do a better job handling it than we do ourselves. But I was talking to a, a different friend and they said they rolled out like a AI protection kind of thing. And I was like, why, you know, for that exact reason. And they said, no, no, no. Like what it was, was making sure that our users are engaged with only those AIs that we trust that do have the good security teams. And so their focus was on limiting like kind of like the crappy AIs or whatever. So that, that kind of like frame and lens makes sense to me. Yeah. In general, like I think the writing's on the wall. Folks are going to want to use these tools for sure. Yes. And us being like kind of restrictionist security people about it, we're just going to get cut out of the loop. And there is also like more of a like legal kind of aspect here than I'm used to in security things about like where data can go. I really like the threat modeling section of this article. Yeah. More so like the breakdown of preventative versus detective and kind yes. of, the, yeah, I really like that. Cause I think, you know, Travis, you always say it, right? not to show your company or anything, but preventing is always the best place. So roll it out the right way the first time, don't detect the abuse of it. But yeah, I think when you look at supply chain compromises, as an example here, preventative is use on-prem architecture or detective is look at building detection rules that look for API key usage from other locations, right? And so it gives you some options. And as you think about you know, going through this yourself, which you know, once again, really enjoyed. All right, Leaf, take it away. Cool. So last one, this was one that I saw Ian Carroll tweet about earlier today. So hot off the press. Uh, this one is about bypassing airport security via SQL injection. A little bit of background. There are two airport systems that are mentioned. One is KCM, which is known crew member. Uh, you might have seen the security line when you're going through TSA yourself. This is for airport staff or airline staff and allows them to bypass security. And then the other one is CAS, which is Cockpit Access Security System. And this is the system that determines if someone's allowed to sit in a jump seat within the cockpit and is most commonly used for off-duty pilots on flights where there isn't enough room in the, the regular main cabin seats. And so they found an app, FlyCAS, uh, a web app that can help airlines manage both of these systems, KCM and CAS. And unfortunately, the system had SQL injection on the login page. And once they were authenticated, they were able to add an authorized user to KCM or CAS. They were also able to edit an existing record. This was just like a Hollywood hacker sequence where you would be able to edit the name and the photo of somebody in the system and just like change it to you. So it's kind of fun to see when a movie sequence actually is possible in real life, because most of the time it's not very accurate in movies. They reported the vulnerability. It did get resolved. Unfortunately, the response from DHS and TSA was disappointing. They stopped responding to the people that disclosed the vulnerability and then made some incorrect statements online and like 
did some ghost edits to change them. And yeah, it just seemed like the handling of the reports were not very good. But yeah, very, very worrying vulnerability and a very good write-up. Ian Carroll and Sam Curry are awesome. They do really cool stuff. Anything that they publish, I read for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I My general take here is, you know, thank God they made us like take our shoes off and like not carry more than three ounces of liquid. And meanwhile, they have like dumb SQL injection on the thing that like validates the the people that can just like walk through the airport. Like yeah. the whole airport security thing is so performative and like over the top where inconveniencing like hundreds of millions of people with details that literally do not matter at all. And then these like basic things were missing for like the most like 101 level vulnerabilities, like makes absolutely zero sense. Like good thing the bad guys don't know how to do like the most basic like kind of web hacking at all. Like it just, I don't know, the whole thing like irritates me a lot. This is your reminder from Travis to get TSA pre-checked so you can keep your shoes on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, please don't. I want that line <laughs> to stay short. Yep. Well, you we got to upgrade to clear now. There's like, no. there's like tears of it. Clear is bad. Clear sucks. It's all about digital ID, which that line, if your airport has digital ID, it's so fast. I've been at JFK when the clear line and the TSA pre-check line has quite a few people at it. And the digital ID line has never had more than five people. What? I need to do the I've never third heard of thing now. Well, yeah. this is better because it's just from TSA. So if you have TSA pre and you have a passport, at least like I fly mostly Delta. If you have both those in the app, you can just like enroll in digital ID and you probably like give your face to the government or whatever. And it's a line. It works similar to clear where they just do like a photo, mm, photo. Of, but it's not something you have to pay uh, a separate fee for like clear. It's just included in the TSA pre line. But it uh, wasn't this the actual point of TSA pre? Like I'm already, I already like paid them money and like did a thing. Like, why is there a new thing now? Yeah, yeah. This seems like they're just making it so that they don't have to scan your driver's license every time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I see these machines. I, I just looked it up. I see these machines, but they're in our pre-check lines here in Dallas. So we don't have separate lines with these. The annoying thing about clear yeah. is since it's like a sold thing, they'll literally walk those people to the front of the pre-line. That's and the so, best part about it. I know, paid but for VIP access, Travis. It's, it's so annoying. I don't want that airports to be like a paid VIP situation. I just want us to like all go through in the order that we got there. When I, I was in, oh, go ahead. like, you shouldn't be able to get TSA pre if you don't know how to use an airport. Like when the people are in the TSA pre line and they're like, "Do I take the water out of my bag?" It's like, no, man. Like you can't even have water. <laughs> like <laughs> I feel like you should have to prove that you you can efficiently navigate the security line before you're awarded TSA pre because it just slows everyone else down. Yeah. When I was in Denver last, and this will make you happy, Travis, I mistakenly got into the clear line and it was much slower than the pre-check line. Good, as it should be. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, that's it. So we'll be back next month. If you like what we do, then like, subscribe, whatever, whatever all the social stuff is. If you don't like it, go complain to Leaf. He, he takes all of the critical feedback on the show for the team. All right. Thank you all. Have a good month.